Hi everyone, my name is Mastana Moradem. I'm a licensed clinical social worker and the executive director at Cross Cultural Expressions. And I have the uh, honor and privilege to be here today with Maryam Sayyad and with Mojgan um, Moradem Rahbar. And we're going to talk a little bit about the new movie that was uh, produced by the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health in partnership with Cross Cultural Expressions. So it's a mental health movie called The Gin in the Pen. And we want to talk a little bit about uh, the association of this movie specifically with mental health and mental well being and psychology, and also really delve into the mythology and cultural aspects of this movie. And so before we really delve into that, though, I want to introduce kind of the parts and the roles that the three of us played within this movie. Um, so in my part, uh, I was the executive producer on the movie, as well as the writer and the director. And um, uh, Maryam Sayyad was the myth consultant, Dr. Maryam Sayyad, who has a PhD in mythology. We have the great honor that she was the myth consultant and story consultant on the movie, as well as one of the associate producers and the artistic director, amongst many other hats that I think <laughs> she wore. <laughs> we all did multiple things yeah. on it. And Mojgan um, Moradam Rahbar, uh, who is sitting to my right, uh, was the associate producer, story consultant, cultural consultant, as well as uh, she provided the uh, translation and adaptation into uh, Persian or Farsi. Um, we also had the privilege, because this movie was um, subtitled in not only Persian and Farsi, but also in Russian, uh, to have uh, a wonderful writer, um, translator, Julia Montion, who couldn't be here with us today, but she was the cultural consultant and translator and adaptation uh, person into the Russian language. So I just wanted to kind of introduce her, even though she's That's not here. Wonderful. She couldn't be here today. Um, so I thought we would kind of get started, because I think a lot of people, one of the questions that I often get uh, as we were creating this movie was why the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health uh, chose to make a movie. And so I have to say before we get started in answering that question that this was specifically um, a project of the Eastern European, Middle Eastern, underserved cultural communities subcommittee of the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health. And so right off the bat, the um, really goal of this subcommittee is to create uh, awareness around mental health topics and mental health wellness and really to try to decrease stigmas that are, awful, uh, that are often um, associated with mental health and receiving of mental health services particularly within the uh, Farsi-speaking and Russian-speaking cultures. And so uh, this, this movie was really geared uh, to incorporate some of the um, uh, life circumstances, cultural issues, and mental health issues that tend to arise within those specific cultures. Um, but I, I think we would all agree that a lot of the issues are quite universal and really um, related to a lot of immigrant cultures and immigrant communities. So, I think, uh, yeah. if, I, if I may say so, it was interesting for me that uh, you had done another uh, movie previously with the uh, Department of, uh, LA County Department of Mental Health called Wake Up Sleeping Beauty which was also produced in Russian and Farsi, uh, Persian. Yes. But there is a bit of a change this time with this movie about the language that you chose to do the language all in English and then have the subtitles in Russian or in Farsi, which I think was wonderful because 
of the feedback that I imagine you got and we all got was that a lot of the uh, younger generation, I wouldn't even say younger generation, anybody under age 65 really, uh, even if we are, we were born in Russia or in Iran, uh, it is comfortable for us to understand the English language, although we would like to know how this particular sentence would translate in Farsi or in Russian. And uh, I think this, um, uh, the change that you did, that the movie itself is in English with subtitles, enables us all to understand it, especially the younger generation, who may not have such a uh, good command of their uh, parents' native language of Farsi or Russian. And that's exactly so. the, um, yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that's exactly the feedback we got. I think after we did Wake Up Sleeping Beauty, which was really uh, two recordings, um, one in uh, fully Russian cast and in Russian, and the other one fully uh, Iranian cast and in Farsi. While it was really appreciated by the community as we went back out to do kind of um, you know focus groups and to kind of gauge the communities, each community to see how they would like this second movie to be done. That's exactly the mm -hmm. feedback we that got was, was that it would be great to have it in English this time with the subtitles uh, so that we can engage a younger audience because there are people whose Farsi or whose Russian might not be as good but to have that combination of the language being in English with the subtitles kind of makes it a um, uh, kind of a film that uh, families can watch together exactly. and have conversations around together. So yes, that, that was absolutely uh, the goal behind it. And, and really, again, going back to this idea of why a movie, um, it's because, you know, we're always trying to um, find different ways to uh, tell our stories because the stories that we tell and the learning that we get out of uh, the arts um, or our art, you know, artistic endeavors such as movies or books or uh, literature or mythology and all of that is so great. I mean, the wisdom that you're able to share with those mediums is so great. Yeah. And, so it's it's compelling and um, hopefully it'll have a uh, entertainment value alongside oh, yeah. um, a helpful one. Mm. I mean, well, talk to that. this it 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 brings up sort of why uh, both of these films um, they focused around a fairy tale. Each of them is based on a fairy tale. Sleeping Beauty, of course, uses themes from the. Um, Grimm's Brothers fairy tale of Briar Rose, but are also the Disney version of Sleeping Beauty. So it's a story that we all know, m several generations. And this one, um, the Jinn uh, in the pen, of course, incorporates the story of Aladdin and the enchanted lamp. Um, well, why is that? How does this help us? I mean, if the if the if the point is to kind of make it. Um, you know, allow people to take care of their mental health and to seek psychological services. Well, first you have to have a dialogue about psychology, and maybe these uh, the reasons that these communities need a little bit extra push in getting the mental services that they need is because the language of psychology isn't hasn't really been incorporated into these cultures yet. Right. You know, this is a fairly um, a fairly new thing. I mean, even even in Europe and in America, this is what fifty years old, where or much less probably where it's become common mm -hmm. um, for people to seek psychological services. But it's it's much less common in um, the Iranian community or in the Russian community. So to now just be through these means of fairy tale and myth and storytelling to just be drawing attention to the inner world by interpreting these stories psychologically now we can have a we can begin to have a conversation about the psyche right which is really the goal here is to really delve into the psyche mm -hmm. and also uh, the environment, our environment, and our ancestral kind of um, 
link in the development of our psyche and how that uh, comes out in our everyday moods and feelings and behaviors. And so it's really very interconnected. For sure. I think I really appreciate it. I appreciate that the wake up sleeping beauty and the gin in the pen also because it's a way for me to relate to my children. Because these are stories that, you know, as children, we read them the stories of the, you know, the genie and, and Sleeping Beauty and now putting it in this context and bringing in so many of these inner psychological issues, it's a way for me to connect with my children to, you know, open up the conversation in a way that we have shared before. So it's a new twist on these old yeah. stories which there is already a knowledge and understanding between us. So, and again, I go back, I appreciate that this um, movie is in English with Persian subtitles or Russian subtitles because my children had a hard time understanding the Farsi, so they had to read the English subtitles. But this way, it's so much easier for us to just sit there and talk about it now. Right. So, right. Absolutely. And to be honest, even for, um, I'm not, you're, Persian is much, uh, it's pretty advanced, but yeah. even for, for us, for myself, or for, excuse me, for, for Mastan, I would say um, having it be in English actually speaks to us more because we are kind of in this in between. Exactly. We're in the, this in between the where we're very much Iranian, but we don't, we're not as fluid in the, with the language, but we are still very much Iranian. Yeah, <laughs> I think. Uh, you know, language might be something that people start to assimilate to mm -hmm. fairly quickly, but the um, cultural uh, traumas and triggers that we carry as immigrants and the values and the beliefs, that stays intergenerationally. I mean, there are um, definitely, uh, you know, young people that I work with right now who have never been to Russia or never been to Iran, and yet still very much uh, hold that as their, you know, main identity in terms of their um, culture. So uh, I think it's, it's really important um, when you're trying to serve the whole immigrant community to really provide programs in different languages that they can connect to and relate to. What I also really liked about this uh, particular movie uh, was the storyline that the storyline actually uh, goes into the psyche of what I like to call the sandwich generation. Mm -hmm. So you have this, uh, the character, the mother and the daughter, and then you, she makes you understand what it is that I'm feeling when it comes to my son or my child and my parent. So I think that was the, one of the beauties of this uh, story that it takes us through the grief and the change of uh, how I feel about my parents because at the end of the day there was a certain uh, way of that I had to take care of them because we moved to a you know, foreign country. There was a certain feeling of that even the obligation and, and yeah. then now my child doesn't feel that because it's a whole different uh, dynamic. So how am I going to understand that change now. Mm -hmm. Without feeling like resentful and exactly. angry. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah, I love that, for sure. Yeah, and um, I think this movie, The Gin, the Gin and the Pen, uh, in it we really tried to um, address uh, the mental health issues around grief and loss, as well as just the traumas experienced um, through the process of immigration by a lot of immigrant communities. And I think those were like the main uh, key mental health concepts that we focused on. Um, and really that was from feedback from the community, both the Russian and the uh, Farsi speaking communities who really said, we'd like to really hear more about grief and loss. Well, how often, I mean, it's, it has to be the number one reason why somebody even goes into a therapist's office is to deal with some some kind of loss, I would assume. Absolutely. It's, true. it's that traumatic event or that grief or the loss that really brings up the feelings of the anger and the depression um, that 
are really symptomatic of those core issues that usually bring someone uh, into an office, or at least should bring someone into mm -hmm. the office. You know, those are the things that really affect people so greatly. So um, that that was kind of the main thing that we tried to do was picking this character of Nadia, who is this you know um, kind of middle-aged woman who I think has lived a lot of her life uh, trying to just move forward and trying to uh, protect herself and protect her family, uh, almost in a way not wanting to directly deal with the tra trauma and the grief and the loss that she had experienced in her earlier years but more trying to run away from it or distance herself from it until such time where, uh, you know, more triggers of that grief and loss came up in her life. So now she really had to take it face on and it wasn't something that she can deny or belittle or run away from anymore. And so I think that was... Yeah, I believe as we age, as we get older, and I'm saying this because I'm the oldest of, of the three of us, <laughs> Uh, it's interesting how many of these feelings or, or um, uh, traumas that you were able to control just by the fact of saying, you know, I, I'm just doing my thing, I'm controlling it, I'm in control, I know how to deal with it, I am done with it. As you get older, the control starts to slip because uh, your body changes, your psyche changes, things happen to you that didn't happen before. I mean, uh, from physical to psychological and you notice that oh my god this control is slipping and as the control is slipping I understand that I haven't resolved it yeah. I've just uh, put it in some kind of a, a closet and closed the door now it's opening up and it's all filling and it's all coming out now what do I do exactly so, and I guess which that's is, where the gym really, comes in yeah. really where we find uh, you know our uh, main character in the story, Nadia, is that moment of all of these emotions, all of these feelings, all of these traumas are being re-triggered, they're coming back to me, and so she's kind of found herself in a uh, symbolic or quite literal cave, mm -hmm. you know, that she's, she's, she's just, yeah, mm -hmm. she's just stuck in, and she doesn't know how to shift or move or uh, go from here. Yeah, and I really like the whole idea of the underworld. The, and, and that was interesting, trying to translate it, the underworld and what, what it is and how we don't want to go there and we don't even, we pretend it doesn't even exist within us, but it's there. How did and you translate to underworld in Persian? Uh, that one I had to do a literal translation and you know, I think Persian myth mythology itself is so rich that, that people do understand it, but there was very many different aspects which I like to say that, you know, for those who read the subtitles, we had to do adaptation and translation yes. because there are so many things that made sense in the English version that you had to adapt it a little bit to make the words a bit more different to make it make sense or relay the same feeling that you're yeah. trying to exactly. give. Exactly. And we well really want to get into like some of the stuff that you um, had to deal with with that. but. Before we go there, um, so obviously we talked about how we have used, whether in Wake Up Sleeping Beauty or the Jinn and the Pen, kind of these uh, archetypal mythological characters and also um, these mythological ideas like the underworld. And so um, do you want to talk a little bit about that and maybe how it relates to this character who's in this particular place in her life where she feels really stuck and yeah. why, uh, you know, the Jin character, which for those of you who might not know, the Jin, which is the same as the genie character, kind of relates. Well, in actually, um, when Mojnan was talking, she, she, she was bringing us there almost. Um, well, to say that the, the starting point of the story was to talk about grief and loss. I remember. I remember when, uh, when we were trying to do this, 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 this paralleling of some kind of psychological phenomenon 
with a fairy tale or a sort of a, a, a mythic motif. And you said you wanted to talk, you wanted to make this one about grief and loss, that that's the topic that was presented to you. And to, to go from saying, I want to talk about grief and loss, to, well, let's bring up the story of Aladdin and the Enchanted Lamp. Right. I mean, there were, a few, there were a few jumps that were made there. And it's just the way that we got from point A of loss to point B, which was how we could really use the motif of the jinn and the lamp, was that in the story of Aladdin and the Enchanted Lamp, I mean, we've all seen the Disney version, but let me just take us to the um, Thousand One Nights version. Aladdin finds himself trapped in um, a crypt. Like he's been taken there by the magician and he's been put in this underworld. What's happened to him is that he's arrived at the lowest point of his life. He thinks he's going to die. Um, he's feeling guilt about not having uh, been mature enough and having caused his father's death because he wasn't responsible enough. So he's at a very low point. And if we think about this as you know, Nadia being at the lowest point of her life, we can see that there's, there's a parallel here. Now the story of Aladdin then goes to that next, reaches for that next thing, which is now what? Now how? how do I get out of here? And what happens with Aladdin is that, of course, he finds the lamp, again, at the very lowest point of the crypt, and he finds this magic ring. And the very first thing that he wishes for is just to survive, just to live. So we begin to have an inkling of what happens when we are at the lowest point. You know, the lack that is suddenly before us in that place of loss and grief, it has this um, magical value, if you will, of being able to identify uh, exactly what it is that will uplift, exactly what it is that you need, exactly what it is that you wish for. And that is what Nadia finds. You know, she finds the jinn. She finds a little bit of magic in this deepest point of what is hell for her. And so that is how we made mm -hmm. sort of a, how we got from like the psychological phenomenon of loss to the story of Aladdin and the enchanted lamp. And then the rest is just amplification. It was mostly your psychological um, work with uh, some of the motifs in this story. What I really liked, uh, the one change that was made, mm -hmm. uh, was putting the gin inside the pen. Mm. Because then that brings us to the whole idea that Mastana was really adamant that she wants to talk about, which was the mindfulness and being aware of what we're doing. Because when you're writing something, you're really aware of what you're doing because you're writing it. And I think that putting the jinn, or the magic as you call it, in that pen just so shows us how um, we, we are the, the ones that write our own faith. We, we are that person. And uh, I, I don't want to say that we are in control. I want to say that we are the creators, which is a little bit different than being in control of the situation. But we are creating the situation. And I think that the putting the gin or that magic inside the pen instead of the lamp sort of uh, was very well uh, was really balanced. Yeah, it was mm -hmm. a good touch too. And still is a small object <laughs> yeah. that holds, you know, great that power. holds great power. Yeah. Like something is cramped into it. There's all of this emotion and all of this longing and all of this desire that's cramped into one tiny little object. Yeah. And um, really, for me, the use of the pen really coincides with one of my favorite theoretical perspectives when I personally work with clients, which is the idea of utilizing uh, the narrative uh, theoretical perspective mm -hmm. to work um, in healing and recovery. 
And so when you're doing narrative therapy, narrative therapy essentially asks the individual to really view their life and their life circumstance as a story and really asks them to take the pen, quite literally, and rewrite and add to the story in a way that helps them soften or shift the perspectives sometimes their belief systems really having mm -hmm. to surrender those belief systems or those stories that kind of hold us back and keep us in a state of depression or anxiety and to really rewrite your story mm -hmm. so that you can find the wisdom or the upliftment in it which is in my translation that's where the magic lies is where you can see almost the beauty in every aspect of your story. And so, and then really going back to mm -hmm. helping each of us feel so, feel the power, feel empowered by the idea that anytime we pick up that pen, we can write a new version of our story, whether it's the past, but really dealing with the present. You know, how we really have the most power in the present to write out what our future holds or what today holds. And I think that that really, um, for me, was why it was important to shift it from a lamp to a yeah. pen, because there's so much power within, within there's that. There's so much magic in it. Yeah. There's actually so much magic in, uh, in what you're describing right now, in the fact that we, like a human being, we're these wish makers, right? It's like we long things into being. We desire them into being. We wish them into being. That's magical. <laughs> I think a lot of times, especially when we are hit with a particularly traumatic experience that does put us in a state of grief and loss and you know, uh, all of those symptoms of depression and anxiety that follow that, we see ourselves as a, a powerless entity that things are being done to. And so really holding that pen and becoming a uh, part of the creation of your own life, no matter what your experience has been, I think that there's a lot of power there. And I think that there's a lot of healing there. To know that whatever the experience has been, you hold the pen to create whatever uh, perception or feeling that you want from that and to write the story moving forward and so seeing ourselves as part of the creative process rather than just an entity that things are being done to I think really can be helpful and shifting. I actually have two questions from you one is you talked about narrative therapy can you just explain to us what narrative mm -hmm. therapy is? I mean it's essentially I mean it, it would take quite a while to get into the details of it, but narrative therapy really asks that uh, the client or the person seeking healing starts to view their life from kind of a pulled back perspective as a story, as a whole story, okay, so. and to really relate to it as a story moving forward as well, again, to feel that power. Sort of like the how creator. the Jen does it, reads the story and exactly. tells Nadia this is such a beautiful fairy tale and Nadia and doesn't agree, right. but it and is a beautiful so, fairy and tale. And so really trying to, I, what I tried to do was put those into the movie, those aspects of narrative therapy that we work with and we deal with. And my other question is actually for Mariam, on the posters of uh, the Jen in the pen, the beautiful bird is holding the little uh, feather pen. What is the significance of the bird and the pen? Oh. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's such good, a good it's story. It's good to talk about because yeah. we actually refer to the bird quite often in the movie as well. Yeah. So if you can explain. Uh, well, the bird in, in, in the poster really came out more like a phoenix, didn't it? It's kind of this, this fire, fire bird. Um, and there's you know, that, that really applies to Nadia, it really applies to this, this particular uh, discussion of the death that is required to regenerate new life, to actually bring new life into being. But the, the ha why we started with a bird motif is because, again, in Aladdin and the Enchanted Lamp from A Thousand and One Nights, not the Disney version, at the end of the story, the djinn 
um, explains to Aladdin where he comes from, right? Until then, Aladdin has been his master. And at the very end of the story, he reveals that, no, actually, I have a mistress that far surpasses you, sir. Um, and he explains that I, I, uh, my mistress is the rock bird's egg. Um, well, I did a little bit of you know, amplification work of sort of tracking things. And in the process of interpretation, you find that the rock bird is sort of the, the Arabic equivalent to the Seymour of the Iranian mythic tradition. Which would be the phoenix? Um, it's, it's not exactly the phoenix. It sometimes gets translated as the phoenix, but phoenix is Qoqnus. However, Seymour and Rockbird are also predatory birds. So, I mean, we took some, some creative license here to do the mix. What's the mythological yeah. significance of the phoenix? It's the bird that uh, um, it, it, it burns something burns and then this phoenix rises from the ashes. It is that thing that rises from the ashes. Oh, so that, that's where the jinn, I mean, I'm sure everybody has seen the movie where the jinn points to the poster or the painting of yeah. the phoenix and says, uh, there is always birth from death. So the, yeah. the, the living, the, the continuation. So that's, that's right. why the... So we got to, to work with it as a phoenix and a seymour simultaneously because in the, the Iranian seymour in the Book of Kings um, gives Zal a feather and says, whenever you need, need some, some magical help, a magical that's aid, true. you just burn this feather and I'll take care of it. So the seymour kind of becomes this, ma this wish-fulfilling uh, figure. Um, which I want to talk a little bit about the concept of magic because obviously throughout the movie we're really dealing a lot with this idea of magic and um, there's, there's a scene where, um, you know, magic in terms of wish making so that I could do magic and make your wish come true and there's this, there's the scene which really the Jin character, the genie character explains the idea of magic as being that moment where you're able to look at your whole story and see the beauty in everything, even in the loss, even in the grief, even in the trauma. And if you're able to see the beauty in all the characters and in everything, then that's really magic. Meaning that that's the meaning where you will come in contact with that feeling of love or, or all of those uh, feelings of acceptance and uplifted feelings that we associate with joy and happiness. Mm -hmm. um, I know that um, within uh, more old world cultures, uh, whether it's Iranian or, or Russian, this idea of magic being used to bring upon freedom and upliftment and love might be something more difficult to deal with and so I wanted you to maybe speak a little bit about that. Yeah, actually that was one of the things that we had to do the adaptation a little bit because I noticed as I was trying to translate that the word magic, uh, there is only one translation for it in, in Farsi. And uh, the translation is uh, not a nice one mm -hmm. because it is translated more as witchery. And witchery is always something that you associate with the dark magic, with something uh, mean and uh, mean-spirited kind of a magic. So that's the only thing that you can say. And it was very interesting that there was no way to say um, uh, magic in a way that it's happy, you know, because a mag magician does tricks and it's happy and it makes you feel good. Uh, That's so, so interesting. It was, yeah, yeah. So we don't have a word. So it, it's like mm -hmm. a magic is sort of like a witchery uh, combined with alchemy, something that makes something good out of the whole the magical process. So it was interesting that for the Farsi um, uh, translation, I always had to put some kind of a adjective in front of the word magic so that you would let people know that it's good. This is, this is, we are really, yeah, we're talking about it in a positive way. It's not because somebody has put a spell on you or, uh, it, it was very interesting to find the different ways that um, our uh, uh, languages uh, really define us and the customs and the cultures 
that come through the wars and the languages, they limit us because of whatever reason, at some point, somebody decided that a magician is something dark and magic is something dark. Although magic can be wonderful if used in a wonderful, it can be miracle. So I, I constantly had to say miraculous magic, <laughs> yes. you know, so it's like, that's, and it's very interesting that's the Eastern and the Western. I think in the West, it's, it's very recently that we are trying I to think make so. I think this, magic uh, something positive. And I think that, you know, uh, I, I, I almost use that deliberately, though. I know that magic can have a negative connotation within the old world cultures, like the Russian or the um, uh, Iranian cultures or Persian cultures. And I think sometimes we have to update our uh, vocabulary to meet a new belief system and a Absolutely. new way of telling yeah. our stories. And so that really directly came from the process mm -hmm. of a, a lot of conversations with clients where I would say, well, you know, if, if you start making this good that you are making bad right now, magically you're going to feel better. And the resistance to that of, but no, that can't work. And I'm like, well, try it. You know, now, now you're going to make this good. And look, now magically you feel better. And this idea of how much of that idea of magic is really related to the perceptions that we hold, again, about these stories that we tell of ourselves. Mm -hmm. And so there's a lot of power in that. And so I think... Part of the character of the jinn for me was definitely uh, someone who is showing the character of Nadia that this, this, you don't need me for this power. You only need me to teach it to you because once you understand this concept, then the magic is mm -hmm. within you and it's yours for the having. This, this brings up one of the things I, I, I really admired in, in your script, and it was your approach to nature. The relationship between the jinn and nature. You know, what you're saying right now makes me think, well, what you're talking about is a magic that is actually available. Mm -hmm. It's, it's that, that healing, that creative ability, that the fact that life wants to keep going and joy wants to keep being renewed. This is all part of nature. And so this magic is part of nature. But if you can speak a little to, about um, the relationship between the jinn and nature. Really Absolutely, like yeah. and there is a scene where the jinn actually yeah. says, you know, I'm part of nature, I can't go against nature. And so I think very simply then what we've learned from the natural world and the natural process is that change is inev inevitable, that there's always going to be death followed by birth, followed by death, followed by birth. That's the whole concept of the seasons, where you go from, you know, summer to fall where the trees lose all their fruit and their leaves to winter back to spring and that this has to repeat itself. And if you just surrender to the idea and are flexible and fluid with this movement, then the story of your life is gonna be much more filled with joy rather than if you try to stop this inevitability of the change and the movement. So yeah, I love, I love how, how the jinn says that, says, you know, you just think death is bad because they've told you death is bad. Right. But really, sometimes you just think, do I really want to live forever? I, I don't think so. You know, you get and to really, how else do you value life, life but in contrast And I love the idea. fact that when he shows her the door, he says both death yeah. and birth are through the same yeah. door. And it's... it's both a release. It's both something wonderful that you can go through and uh, have fun with. And again, we go back to how our customs and cultures, for whatever reasons, have started limiting us. And um, was it like this 2,000 years ago? I don't know. Things change. And a lot of that limit comes in from this idea of protecting us, right? Yeah. But then you protect yourself to paralysis, That's which the, is yeah. one of the things that the Jin says. So guys, I think mm -hmm. uh, we could talk about this forever and ever, but mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I thank you so much for joining me. Obviously, uh, we do uh, want to start wrapping it up, but what I'd really like to wrap it up with is this uh, notion that 
Um, for those of you who are not familiar with therapy or resistant to go into therapy, this is what therapy really looks like, kind of what we did today, which is really bringing up a story, often the stories associated with your own life, and sitting with someone and really kind of starting to connect it uh, and trying to shift perceptions around it. I think that for a lot of people, there's this idea that, you know, I have to be you know, crazy to go into therapy or mentally disturbed. And honestly, therapy is just a way that we renew ourselves, where we tell our stories, where we try to find beliefs and um, perceptions that help us feel more uplifted. And so, if anything, I think that's the message that we want to bring to our communities as we do this work. I think this was and beautiful. The three of us just had a group therapy session. A group session. therapy session, exactly. <laughs> Um, I do want to say that, uh, you know, if for anybody who is seeking mental health services, you can always reach out to the LA County Department of Mental Health's Mental Health Access Line, and that phone number is 1-800-854-7771, and this is a resource line that helps people of all languages and all cultures with um, referrals and resources to culturally appropriate mental health um, guidance and therape therapeutic services. So again, uh, it's the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health access line 1-800-854-7771. And if you haven't already, I hope you click on the link and uh, watch the gin in the pen. Uh, again, you can watch uh, the Russian version, uh, which has Russian subtitles and is more geared towards the Russian uh, uh, culture, or the Iranian or Persian version, which has Farsi subtitles and is geared more towards the people from uh, the Iranian or Middle Eastern Iranian cultures. Or watch it in English or watch for it everybody in, else. Both of them are in English. Um, so we invite you to do that. Thank you so much, Marianne. Thank you so much, Mojga. Not just for being here today, but for everything you had done to really make this movie a reality because it you was definitely I, not a one person. I would job. like to thank you for always uh, coming up with such amazing uh, creative ideas yeah. and uh, bringing it to us and letting us grow from it. It's really appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. And Indeed. so therefore, I have to thank the Los Angeles County Department of Mental Health uh, for really having the vision and providing the funding so that um, these underserved cultural communities can access mental health services and start discussions around mental health issues uh, through a different lens and through a different capacity. And with that, I want to thank you all and uh, we'll hopefully see you next time.